Oh, hi there. My name is Shaz. We're taking a break from your reg regularly scheduled... Fuck. Do the video over again. Oh, hi there. My name is Shaz. We're taking a break from your regularly scheduled journal videos in order to smoke a joint. What I was thinking was, um... <clears throat> hmm. I was thinking, I have these leftover joints from last weekend going into Slab City, where I spent some of my, well, I don't have any income right now, so some of the gifted money from my folks, uh, I guess grocery money, they left me money to feed myself. Um, I did buy groceries, $50 worth of groceries, and then the rest of the money, I bought some weed and went out to Slab City, which is an interesting place. You feel like you're definitely outside the dominant culture when you're out there. Met some veterans, some uh, fellow uh, Zen Buddhists, some musicians, played some music, talked some, uh, talked some Zen, talked some military, mostly. Also got high, got really high. We went to a, it's just a whole scene. That's a whole, pretty sure that's what I'm going to be doing in 2019. But I don't, I'm trying to finish up a project. And weed is good for brainstorming, not the best for actual getting the job done. Maybe. If I'm going to, um, I'll probably save a joint or two. I have about three. I'll save one and I'll do a final edit and I'll probably get high and read it, try to read it fresh. But as for right now, I'm going to get rid of these guys so they don't fall into the um, less discerning hands. Me, um. I don't know. Maybe that's how I feel about drugs sometimes. Pizza, too. My parents brought home half a, a whole pizza last night. And I ate half of it last night, half of it today. I'm like, you know, this isn't healthy for them. It's better if someone like me takes care of it. Also, we got to see the, the work being done in the gym. It's been a couple weeks in the gym, and now I'm starting to get some of my strength back. Not all of it, but a little bit. i am gained about 15, 20 pounds over the last two months. That's healthy. That tells you that I was walking around 160, 165. And now I'm about 180. The gym I was at 190, but that was with clothes on and with a full workout. So 180, 185, which is usually why I walk around about 183, 185. My strength's coming back, not all the way. But um, now I'm bench pressing 70s. When I first started, I was doing, um, not when I first started, but about six weeks ago, I was doing, five weeks ago maybe, five or six, four or five actually. Yeah, about November 10th, so probably just about a month. Jumped up from uh, 60 pound weights to 70 pound weights. So hopefully in a month, gain my strength back about 10 pounds a month. In a month, I'll be back up to doing 80, 85s in each hand. It's another interesting thing, um, working out. I was telling some old timer today, he jumped on my machine. I was like, old timer. I'm, I'm using that machine. Can I work in with you? He's like, cool, cool. You're doing 180? And I'm like, yeah, that's a pull-up. I should be able to pull my own weight up. It was like these <laughs> machines. Because my grip is like, that's interesting. I noticed with my pull-ups, I was like, not even looking at the scale, I knew I was putting on weight because I was getting heavier than my body could lift up. Just my grip. My I think the muscles are keeping up, but grip is a bitch. Grip takes a while to work on. In my experience, grip is just slowly but surely hang from the pull-up bar do little grip exercises but you guys stick with it and after like three months six months your grip will really get better um, i could hang like a good like minute and a half two minutes i want to work back up to that hanging hanging from stuff is a very functional exercise but what we're going to do today we're going to smoke it's about three minutes when did i start this yeah any minute now about three minutes before uh, marijuana starts affecting you I smoke about half a gram joints, so usually it's a lot for people to share. Between two people, get us both pretty stoned. For me myself, it gets me as high as I could get. I could do two of these, but one is pretty much that's like me zero to a hundred. Um, you you don't get much higher unless you get edibles and shit. I'll do like one of these, and then maybe I'll do another one in a little bit. But I'm not going to do that here because we have to fucking get a video done. One of these between three or four people is a decent little buzz. 
<clears throat> between two people is a nice conversation. You're both pretty lit. One person, that's, that's like a little personal challenge. I'll do one of these and I'll be driving. And, um, yeah. That whole, like, I could still do this, but I'm high. So you just got to pay attention. Weed affects not your motor, motor skills, not as much. I don't think so. I, I, I would bow to the science on that and do more scientific studies about people driving and stone. But for me, as long as I keep the thoughts in control, because it makes your thoughts go crazy. Everything else seems to be normal, but I suppose when I'm running for president in earnest, I should probably be more responsible. Don't drive all stoned. I was thinking, don't, don't curse. Clean it up a little bit, Shaz. You could, the strong can afford to be classy. Mm. No, the strong can afford to be kind, but the wise can afford to be classy. There you go. Let's do it that way. It's not. It's a little not classy smoking here in my folks' house. But I was like, you know what? I should probably smoke them sooner than later. And also, you get some stony ideas. I've done 100, going to be 150, 151 videos, something like that. By the time we're done, we have about 30 left. It'd be nice to do a stony one, right? So, like, throw off the glasses, throw off the sweater, and the fucking whole, like, look, which is a cool look. I liked it. But let's just, let's do walkabout Shaz. Shaz as he walks about this earth. See you. Some of these I pack so tight that they go out, which is good. Because then you could save a nice little fucking... That would get you high, this little guy. Just this little third. That's all you need. You need like three or four puffs for a head change. If you're a novice, I would do like one puff. And wait like half hour. Like I say three minutes, it'll kick in. But especially if you're not really sure what being high feels like. Give it a 20, 30 minutes. Give it one like... You're thinking about something. You're like, why am I thinking about that? Oh, maybe I'm high. Um, it's like being aware of your emotions, being aware of your mental state when you are lucid or when you are rational, when you are tripping. I would think is a good skill to have because uh, being a little bit out of control, which is what psychedelics do and weed is a low scale psychedelic. Love will do that to you. Anger, emotions will. So, I believe it's a practice. That's how I use it. And... I think it's a useful practice, but at the same time, the same weights I lift in the gym to get stronger, you could use it to torture someone. So it's all about set and setting and context and voluntary exploration. Yeah, life is like choose your own adventure, right? I wonder about that because I'm like, Shaz. You should start formulating a public opinion about personal and promotional drug use. There's a difference, right? You can do personal actions which aren't a promotion. But I think the only thing I would ever promote is for people to sincerely be themselves and express that in whatever way that doesn't infringe on another's right to sincerely be themselves. Out of but those simple truths, you get the whole basis of society, right? Just do your own thing and don't be an asshole. And then people say, well, Shaz, but why do you record your own thing, though? Why are you uh, doing your own thing so out there? And then I think, See, the thing is you got to keep smoking this or else it'll go out. So then it becomes like fucking endurance training with the joint. See, it went out. I don't know. Now it's just pride. It's like, I'm already high. I could get higher, though. But it's like, I want to finish that joint, though. Yeah. Maybe it's stubbornness. Maybe that's what some drug use is. The people with, like, the fucking heroin and shit. They're just dancing with addiction. They're just like, life bores them. We have a pretty shitty society. Strong people are drawn to dangerous things. 
maybe. Is that why people smoke, or do they just not care? I just smoke, and you just like it's something to do. Once you start smoking, I like smoke. I just think it's a little stupid because of the risks, but fucking chilling, smoking cigarettes, fun. That's maybe why I like joints. I don't know. I need to always be smoking, but when I smoke joints, I smoke a couple, a couple a day. Wake up with one, usually end the day with one, and then maybe one or two in between, depending on who you're hanging out with. But that's one way to live. Reading a lot, writing a lot. Now, my life right now, weed is a a treat, which is good, because as far as treats go, it's not that bad of one. Get stoned, and then you're just like, oh. This is what I am for a minute. I'm still. It goes away. It's interesting. You get, you think differently. And it would be interesting. So I have three hours to do of Occupy. And we're 11 minutes into this hour. So I was like, why not do it stone? That would be interesting. And then, like, now the challenge is this are that I have to finish this up, which I think my folks just left, so it's 2.25. So as long as by like 3, 5.15, we're wrapping up. Just planning it out. Good day. That's how you become a productive stoner. You actually have a plan. You're just like, I'm just plugging into the plan. And that's all, just plugging into the plan. But then what's negative is also a strength. Now your scattered brain is a positive because you can freely associate about what's actually on your mind. Anyways. I'm acting like you're a person that I can ignore, but I can't. You're a fucking camera. You're always fucking paying attention to me. What a fucking... You know what's weird is I'm actually realizing I'm becoming friends with my camera. You spend so much time reading in front of this little screen and I'm just seeing myself it's like oh I wanted to visit myself again like I started a dialogue on myself that's interesting I answer my own questions but it's only like it's in the present like hmm. that's interesting because you got your past self which are your memories you can't really change that person he takes a while to change you have to have new memories and you live through stuff, and then all of a sudden your past self starts like becoming something. You're shaping it. And then the future self seems to be, um, I guess we try to shape that too. I don't know. How do we try to shape it? The future self with our, our willpower, our plans, try to give ourselves options. I'm recording. my present self, which becomes my past self when I watch this again as my future self, Uh uh-huh. And in that way, this dialogue will connect all the selves that I have. It will become a memory, but it's also directed at my future self. So then when I watch it, there's actually another side to it. That's interesting. So I shouldn't get so upset if conversations seem half finished because there's another part to it coming when I watch it. That's really cool. That allows you to have peace with your past actions, I guess. Because you're like, there's gonna, I'm going to speak on this. I'm going to. That's what the, the benefit of reviewing your life is, maybe. You're like, I've spoken on everything that I think I needed to speak on or most things enough to to explain where I'm coming from. It's interesting. But as I wrap up this project, I'm going downhill, so it makes more sense, or at least I have more peace with it. Because I'm like, fuck, I spent this much time on it. Might as well, might as well be something. Occupy guide. I have twenty things to do, and I have three hours, so I have to do one every like ten minutes. About 15. So, so when I got there, I now I actually feel like I'm being fucking interviewed. Shit.
Cause I'm all stoned, so I'm looking at it from the other side. I'm like, there's a fucking a mic, and a fucking camera. Huh. It's interesting. I'm just gonna be like that quiet stoner. I'm just not gonna say anything, and then this will be like 40 minutes of me just sitting here. But then it'd be more authentic, and then my future self, I think, would understand that. And then I'd be like, this fucking awkward motherfucker is gonna make me watch him be silent for 40 minutes. I'm like, I'm like, I have a choice, dude. You just gotta ride out the high sometimes. <laughs> you just gotta be like, oh, I'm just chilling. <laughs> Life could pause for a minute. Just get yourself paused. Yeah, that's kind of, being high is kind of like therapy like that, I think, taking timeouts. Putting yourself on like a sensory timeout. Huh, that's cool. Feel a little bit insulated. My senses, even my skin, everything's a little bit like, it's nice, that euphoric feeling. Hmm. It's an antidepressant, maybe. That's fine. Hmm. Or maybe I was feeling kind of like the death of my parents. They came back from my grandma dying. Went up there to visit her, and then she died while they were visiting, so it was good timing. Yeah. Checkout was Sunday, and grandma died on Saturday. I didn't even have to get another day at the hotel. Crazy shit. I don't know. A lot of details my mom told me. It's interesting family stuff. Family stories and how they fit in. Try to be empathic and say, oh, well, I told my dad I'm glad he's still here. And tell people you love him. Give them their flowers while they're here. But, um,. Occupy. What's the time? 17 minutes. Yeah. So 17 minutes. Occupy. Um, when I got to the park, I was handing out my business card like a dumbass, being like, hey, yeah, my name is Shaz. This is my website. This is what I'm about. I'm a writer. You know what? Uh, what you doing? What you about? And then um, I noticed all the disorder in the park. And this is kind of like society. Like, imagine I'm a hunter gatherer and I come across the first civilization. And so I see that they have their thing going, that people are living here. I ask if I could join, and people are like, oh, I'm not so sure. But then I start making friends. And at night, I just walk around doing, like, security with people. And then when everyone's crashing, I'm like, yo, can I just crash in the corner or something? And uh, so I ended up staying at the anarchist squad, that, or the communist tent that way. And the anarchists were over there, too. And then, um, yeah, I forgot the name of that dude I walk around with at night. Yeah, and then you just make friends, and then I had another tent I could stay in, and uh, people get to know each other. Um, yeah, because what I would do is I would uh, walk around mostly at night so I could catch my sleep during the day when people are out of their tents. Someone would let me crash in their tent or something. What else did I do? Uh, I had a friend in New York I stayed with. But yeah, I um, ran across the anarchist table, and then um, they had literature, so I would pass out literature, and this is some of the literature. Um, I thought things were more organized, so afterwards it actually it matters that people were putting this stuff together. Like this might have been the anarchist in our in our in our hearts uh, group, and yeah, the, a new world in our hearts. But, uh, I'm like looking at it like consensus. This is, uh, we had a decision making process how um, everyone will get together, and then, yeah, Occupy Wall Street was, uh, there was a protest outside City Hall during the summer and then there's this magazine and that just was already because of the cuts the austerity and stuff like that this is what 2011 we've gone through a recession and now they're saying that we need to do a lot of cuts on um, public spending in order to bring back the economy and so people are protesting that outside the city hall and then ad busters this radical magazine says let's take these protests down to wall street 
and let's all bring a tent and occupy Wall Street. And the magazine only has a circulation of like 70,000. It's not the biggest magazine, but the people who are already camping out in front of City Hall, so they moved down there and a bunch of other people to the park. And then um, anarchist professor David Graeber, who was uh, in the area with some internationalists at some meeting, and they went down to the protesters and they saw that there was normal political rallying going on where there there were like Democrats and Republicans trying to organize people like they were trying to like or there were like labor issues or something like that but it wasn't so the anarchist um, showed people how to do a consensus um, a general assembly which is an assembly of people and there's like a format for people to speak and stuff like that and uh he had labor on one side and then the consensus people and the anarchists on another side and people kept going back and forth between the groups and eventually they settled around the consensus where or was it the general assembly i'd have to look into the rules of how they do it but like um basically uh it's just a politer way of speaking in public and a way of making decisions too and organizing and out of that and those people who were originally down there people just started coming and then it just grew up to like a standing camp of like 200 people, 200 to 500 during the day. And then you'd have thousands of people visiting. And we had, uh, we served 3,000 meals a day. The whole like uh, tourists and everyone would come through, the people going down to a financial district. Yeah. And then, uh, but then a bureaucracy a group started forming to, uh, to take control of things and so the donations people set up a bank account and then people had access to that bank account you start hearing of people staying in the w right down the street at the hotel yeah like pictures in the newspapers of like a guy coming out of the w who's part of the finance committee for the group and he says that he needed a break or some shit so i got down there right when they pulled some of that money out for a party on halloween got down there november 1st they evicted us the 15th. So for two weeks, I was in that park. Oh, and so I would work with these guys a little bit, anarchists. And spokes, this is how you do the uh, spokes council and clusters. I was wondering, does it have, to, is, how is this related to the General Assembly? But I don't know, I'd have to. What's a collective? It's like, teaching uh, anarchists there. Uh, so that's pretty interesting. They tell you, uh, that's why I was wondering, who put this out though? Because it's like, um, it says Occupy, your guide to the international occupation movement. So this is like saying that it's a whole movement. Like this is like self-awareness that we were a part of a global movement. That's why I was so amazed that it wasn't in Ben Rhodes' book about the Obama administration. I was like, we were very aware that we were, we were getting, and then later on we have documents we are in correspondence with Egypt. Well, we'll go to those, I guess. So yeah, so this one's interesting. I probably spent enough time on this guy. Pro-Egypt visit letter. Oh, I have like fucking cotton. I'm like a motherfucker right now. <sighs> Dear Occupy Wall Street, I am writing you as a representative of a coalition of civil society organizations in Egypt who have come together to collectively monitor the parliamentary elections on November 28, 2011. This election is significant because it will be the first opportunity for the Egyptian people to vote since the revolution began in January and will ultimately decide who is responsible for drafting the new Egyptian constitution. We strongly believe in the role of civil society in keeping this election free and fair, and we welcome the support of the international groups as we stand in solidarity against authoritarianism. Consequently, we would like to invite you to send a delegation as well as a general request 
to your networks to come to Egypt and observe the Egyptian parliamentary elections on November 28th. We will be conducting an international training on November 26th and 27th that you are welcome to join. We are very proud to be the inspiration for such an exciting a global movement and we hope to see all of you in Egypt soon. Sincerely, Mahmoud El Sawi, Executive Director, Horia Center for Human Rights Studies, 49A Salem Street, and in and, uh, Port Said, Egypt. Telephone number 202-569-9252 or 012-755-41790 or 066-3330. There's a 2. There's a 7. Zero. So that pretty much says everything that needs to be said about that. On to the next one. Anti. Oh, there's an anti-Egyptian letter. I thought they just wanted us to come there. To our kindred occupiers in Zuccotti Park. When we called out to you requesting you join us on November 12th in defending our revolution and in our campaign against the military trial of civilians in Egypt, your solidarity, pictures from marches, videos, and statements of support added to our strength. However, we recently received news that your General Assembly passed a proposal authorizing 29,000 US dollars to send 20 of your number to Egypt as election monitors. Truth be told, the news rather shocked us. We spent the better part of the day simply trying to figure out who could have asked for such assistance on our behalf. We have some concerns with the idea and we wanted to join your conversation. It seems to us that you have taken to the streets and occupied your parks and cities out of a dissatisfaction for this false promises of the game of electoral politics. And so did our comrades in Spain, Greece and Britain. Regardless of how one stands, on the efficacy of elections or elected representatives, the Occupy movement seems outside the scope. This. The Occupy movement seems outside the scope. This. Your choice to Occupy is, if nothing else, bigger than any election. Why then should our elections be any cause for celebration? when even the best of all possible worlds, they will just be another supposedly representative body ruling in the interest of the 1% over the remaining 99% of us. This new Egyptian parliament will have effectively no powers whatsoever, and as many of us see it, its election is just a means of legitimizing the ruling junta's seizure of the revolutionary process. Is this something you wish to monitor? We have, all of us around the world, been learning new ways to represent ourselves, to speak, to live our politics directly and immediately. And in Egypt, we did not set out to the streets in revolution simply to gain a parliament. Our struggle, which we think we share with you, is the greater and grander than a neatly flunk, flunk functioning parliamentary democracy. We demanded the fall of the regime. We demanded dignity, freedom, and social justice. And we are still fighting for these goals. We do not see elections of a puppet parliament as a means to achieve them. But even though the idea of election monitoring doesn't really do it for us, we want your solidarity. We want your support and your visits. We want to know you, talk with you, learn one another's lessons, compare strategies, <laughs> share plans for the future. Tell us your budgets. Tell us all of your members. Tell us all of your plans, legal and possibly illegal, especially the illegal ones. We think that activists 
or as people committed to serious change in the systems we live in, there is so much more that we can do together than legitimizing electoral process. Leave that boring job to the Carter Foundation. <laughs> that seems so impoverished next to the new forms of democracy and social life we are building. It should build our space and our networks because they themselves are the basis on which we will build the new. Let us deepen our lines of communication and process and discover out these new ways of working together and supporting one another could be. Anytime you do want to come over, we've got plenty of comfy couches available. It won't be fancy, but it will be fun. Yours, as always, Solidarity, comrades from Cairo, 13th November 2011. Yes, we finally got an email address, comrades from Cairo, gmail.com. Sorry, it's Mohammed's fault. He was supposed to do it. He forgot. You're too busy having too much fun. This is interesting, right? We have two sides of it. We have a pro-Egyptian and an anti-Egyptian letter. I think I read both of those quite evenly. Make sure I'm not giving any bias as to which one I believe, of course. I know the score. I know exactly what's going on at all times. I know so much that I don't tip my hand. Because the first thing you know is to keep your mouth shut. I don't even know if Egypt exists. I don't even fucking know it was in Egypt. Egypt fucking... That country, fucking, uh, that's like some ancient civilization shit. They ain't got no Egypt anymore. They got like uh, Afghanistan, Iraq. That one that's like Iraq, but it's Iran. <laughs> Saudi Arabia, Yemen. Yeah, I guess enough of those countries are in the news. They'd probably start learning geography more. It's on the to-do list be cool to have a gym with a fucking geography like on one wall so while you work out you go memorize a country hit a set it'll take your mind off the fucking pain that'd be a good idea, be a good idea. 60 wall street morning freedom slums stuck not happy bills working dead end hurts physical Yes, no, money, queens, hustle, survive, lack of opportunity, resources, not knowledgeable, nothing available. This isn't the best we have. I'm angry. I am angry for the simple fact that I feel the system was designed for people like me. We're poor and we're going to stay poor. We're not going to get anywhere. Money, you're nothing if you don't have money. And I'm just so tired of seeing people dispirited because they can't go nowhere. And that's why we hurt each other. Because that's all we can do. Interview, morning of November 13th, 2011. 60 Wall. What? So this girl, she was like, she was upset. And she wanted to talk to someone. And we're supposed to have these organizational meetings, which I had started attending. So I could get notes and shit. And, um, you know, people get together and talk about, all right, this is supply. And we need, uh, we need to spend this much money on, uh, food how's that going and making decisions but who's in charge and there's no it's like it's echoes of authority without an actual boss we didn't have a ceo we didn't have a top-down plan and so you had human society evolving in echoes and fragments like it didn't you don't have a structure like it seems like we our culture cultures like mushrooms language you see a lot of different connections in how language evolves. Because language evolves, like the species evolves, like our societies evolve. They all have patterns of fractal patterns of growth. So in Occupy Wall Street, you have like, imagine a meeting of people trying to decide, but there's no real reason why they should be associated with each other or should be even deciding. Or I guess it's money, or is, it, is it ideology? We're occupiers, what are we? And then so people have groups, so they... There's a group that says, all right, well, we need to feed people. I'm taking care of that. 
well, we need to house people after we were evicted. Okay, I have the relationships with the churches, and I'm taking care of that. People need subway cards. Right, I'm taking care of that. Now you have five or six groups. Then you have communication. And then what was I? I'm like, well, I want to help out, but I don't know. And so I was starting to put the meetings on. So there's a person who facilitates the meetings. All of these, it's like, which one of these is essential for a society? Is that what we're doing, a society, or is this a corporation? So then I come in saying I want to audit the books. And I was, uh, I was, while I was trying to take it to the nonprofit, I was just, I'd sold shit before. And I was like, um, I'd seen companies start and file like corporate paperwork and shit. So I was like, uh, we should turn this into a nonprofit and start looking into that. But then I got my own private little group. Uh, someone wanted to donate. So I was doing this. This is how that led to that. I was meeting people and talking to them. So that's how I got this poem. This girl, she was looking for this meeting where the people meet in the mornings to decide things. She wanted to get some money for her community or do something, or she wanted to just get involved. She was like, and that's what I was asking her. I was like, you seem frustrated, just talk. And she was like, I'm not. And it, it wasn't an interview. I was just like, just say what's well, on your mind. You got whatever your frustration, that whole, even when I was in the Occupy Wall Street movement, being aware of emotions and like translating it. It's like, I feel you like you're not, Emotions justify themselves, just express yourself. And she just started saying words. So I just wrote down the words that she said, pretty much what she said. And like me, I said physical. So she said, freedom stuck, slums stuck, not happy bills, working dead end and hurts. And I said physical. She's like, yes, no, money. And then I realized, oh, she's just like, uh, I shouldn't try to talk to her. Yes, no, money, queens, hustle, survival, lack of opportunity, resources, not knowledgeable, nothing available. This isn't the best we have. I'm angry. I'm angry for the fact, simple fact that I feel the system was designed for people like me. We're poor and we're going to stay poor. We're not, and now she's speaking in coherent sentences. We're not going to get anymore. Anywhere. Money, you're nothing if you don't have money. I'm just so tired of seeing people dispirited because they can't go nowhere. She's pleading with me. She's looking at me. She's like, that's why we hurt each other because that's all we can do. It's like, who's hurting each other? This is a black girl from um, who's maybe like 17. Or maybe early 20s from like um, Brownsville or somewhere fucking uh, maybe East New York but it's like we saw a crack in the dominant narrative where we can come and tell our story so this lady came out with her story but we had no idea how to plug her in or how to like if you had like that's what I was starting to tell people when I was in there we need onboard onboarding we need a well that's what so later on in some of these um, documents, I have emails with this guy. I should just go, go on and read those. But I was like, we need a ways to, like like myself too, like ways to grab people like me, other people, and plug them in. But people were trying to consolidate their power as opposed to, so they didn't see, it's just the wrong value. So you don't see what your, you call a weakness is actually an asset. They were saying, they were saying people come into the park as a weakness, like, oh, more and more people, fucking this is, but that makes me wonder if were those people, I just assume they're malicious actors. But then I'm starting to realize what the actual scope of society is. is there's a lot of people who aren't malicious actors, they're just dumbasses. And I guess you just give people a lot more credit. And then I guess they earn the right to not give them, I don't know. Anyways, not dumbasses, but just because you see something doesn't mean that someone who doesn't see it is not a, is a dumbass. That's a, a form of humility that could be like, um, that's weaponized humility. Like, you could be humble, but if you're humble to the point that you don't see your strengths, you're going to expect a lot out of other people because you'll think that stuff is just normal. Like, true humility is like truly being blind to your strength. But then, uh, I think that same thing could mean that you're blind to other people's weaknesses. So, I don't know, stuff like, uh, Compassion should be like you're resting. Like if you're not compassionate about something, then you're probably still evolving your opinion of it, or it could be improved. Compassion's a good place to try to end things for everything, because there's very real, there's rare excuses to break your, yeah, break out of chill, or maybe just weed keeps you chill. Anyways, this is a fucking great poem. It's a, it's a great whatever it is, interview or whatever. I wish I got her name. Maybe she remembers me from way back then. I remember the conversations I had, and you had those conversations constantly. So these people, the Occupy Farms people, uh, I got access to, like, uh, info because I was trying to fucking, 
I was obviously into outreach, and so I got someone in charge of our emails, and they gave me like the info email, or they gave me access to something where I could see people emailing the movement. And so these people emailed saying that they wanted to donate a farm to the movement because the fracking company came to their land, and they're behind in their debts, and the fracking company came to their land. I decided to come check it out, and it was like, the minute I walked in and everybody started talking, it was like, it rocked me to the core, and it was just like I identified, and for, you know, I mean, I've sort of suffered in silence over a lot of this stuff for years. I, I did things wrong, and, you know, as I was walking through talking, I realized that everybody else had the same issues. And now that I study all of this, I think it's by design that we don't reach the American dream. You know, it really is just a dream. By design that we don't reach the American dream. The American dream. Because that's, it's true. I mean, I blame myself. Blame myself. You fail. You fail. You fail. Peter gets pissed or Paul gets pissed. Somebody's always mad, you know? It's like, I want my money. I want my money. If you have X amount of dollars, you have to divide it out. My grandmother always taught me that there's two things that come first. Let's keep that roof over your head and eat. And the rest of it, we've lived without electricity. Really? Many yes, times. many times. Because we couldn't pay that bill, and it was more important to eat. And... I mean, our kids, our kids learn. Yeah, we, get pretty resourceful, actually. Yes, we're very resourceful. Get the bucket that? out, because there's a, I guess it's like an $1,000 or whatever. Actually, we used to have an old wood, wood cook stove that we actually would have a big pot of water on, and we'd uh, bathe the kids in it. We heat the water on, on the, the stove. stove yeah. <laughs> in a big canning kettle. Yeah, yeah. That's where they got their bath. But to get water, we went out, and the, yeah, there's, there's a well there. stone yeah. well. Probably been there for Drop 150 years. In. Some of the best times we've had is when we had a pork. You know, we've never had to go on welfare or anything. We've never had to use pork stamps or anything like that. Not that I really got anything against it for anybody that needs it, but we get to where we're eating the wallpaper. You know. I grew up on a farm. We raised beef cattle, pig. My grandmother was the type of person that if you walked into her house, you ate. If she saw someone who she thought needed a meal, they came in. It didn't matter who you were, where you were, she would feed them. He knows. That's just the way she was. Two things that come first. Let's keep that roof over your head and eat. It used to be any, any kid growing up could go work on a farm. You know, many adults could go work on a farm. But the farms are all gone. They're all gone. You can't make a living farming anymore. And that we know of. Right. That, yeah. Well, you can, but it's not legal. Right. The problems are that where we come from is so depressed, and there's nothing there. The farms are gone. The thing about the fracking is a, is a really tough issue with us because we actually almost jumped on board. Well, there's natural gas under the In the rocks. And they right. They well, pressure. the water they and pressure. chemicals down into the rock at high pressure and split the rock apart to release the gas. And people are jumping on board because they think it's the only way they're ever going to save their land. There's nothing else to do. Every year the, the taxes go up, up, up. I mean, that's why we were going to do it, and it's the same with everybody else. It's about the dollar. I mean, if you come to the dollar bill, by God, they're going to cut corners every time. We all know that. <coughs>
that's how people can maybe create something sustainable and human. I really like that idea. Yes. Uh, we should stop when we're ahead then. Yes, <laughs> we should quit while we're ahead. That's cool. They were a very nice, very nice family. And we, um, yeah, we, they said that they wanted to donate their farm to the movement. So that was a huge project. That derailed me for like a whole month. Not derailed, but like, I was like, um, awesome, let's, uh, Sometimes you could be stroking your beard and you could put yourself to sleep. Kind of like a cat. You stroke your beard and all of a sudden you just... Yeah, maybe not. Um, they were a very sweet family. And um, they came down for that interview. I saw their email. They came down. Uh, for the interview, they said that we should go up and visit them. So I got the okay. Um, we didn't have any money. I had to get together a group to go before the General Assembly and ask for money. But I went to create the group and to ask for people who wanted to work on it. Out of there, we got like 10, 15 people already. So we say, all right, throw up like a social media accounts, other stuff. And then we start communicating now on emails and stuff. And you create like a little culture. And... Uh, we had over a week who wants to go up to the farm and so we got like 15 17 people coming that weekend and then uh, so we all meet on like saturday 10 a.m and there's like no plan at all there's just everyone's meeting up and so uh we meet up and uh, I, it's it's almost hard to like remember this stuff it's funny but uh yeah i was using the occupy office there's after we were evicted Someone donated an office down on uh, 60 Wall Street, I think, or 60 Broadway or something. But it was about a block down the street, past Wall Street on Broadway, 60 Broadway. I just paid attention. The General Assembly is when they would say their information because even though people were trying to control the little factions and groups, there was still like a General Assembly every night that listed the stuff that's going on in the movement and what's going on for the protests and stuff like that. And that's when people could come up and put proposals for the, their groups or we want some money for this or that. That's how we came up with that $20,000 trip to Egypt. We were uh, we voted that in. And at that group, you go to these meetings over and over again every night of General Assembly and then all these other little meetings between other caucuses or groups politicking towards what they're going to do at the General Assembly. It's really interesting, this whole fucking galaxy of like, different energies and just and you can tell the malicious actors who are going straight for the resources and because you could see them interact in this whole fucking society is what it is but this mesh of uh, interactions and networks and like two people are dating each other and they're both on finance finance and i brought that up it's like this concentration of power literally there's like a couple in there and then they broke up and it's like what is this even are you really dating each other even or are you really like that that guy was uh, paid by labor unions. Um, Haywood. Haywood, I think it was. Haywood something. He's in an article with me. But um, anyways, you didn't, it was hard to tell people's motives. And I was like, how did I come across? I probably can't. I mean, I don't know. I was trying to be transparent because so I'm trying to sell this book. So yeah, here you go. The Complete American's Guide to a Revolution. <laughs> I put it on Kickstarter. It has um, zero pledge of 10,000, zero backers, and this project was not reached. So that was November. So, like, I did get something up in November, didn't put much effort into it, didn't promote it a lot. But I found these farm people. And, uh, oh, <clears throat> so, and I'm staying in 60 Broadway or whatever. So, uh, I'm in the occupied office. Sometimes I sleep there, even though you're not supposed to sleep there. And I'm only using email, I'll have a cell phone. 
and I'm, I had made an announcement at the General Assembly that we we have a uh, a farm if anyone wants to go, and now we have like about 15, 17 people showed up on a Saturday morning in uh, the atrium, which is right down the street, a place where everyone gathered indoors in this huge public atrium because they can't kick you out technically. It's another. It's, I think you could sleep there too, or I think maybe it shuts down at ten. Uh, yeah, this is just a whole homeless life in this part of Lower Manhattan. There is another other plot spots you could go to. Some delis open 24 hours. You could always sleep in the back at some tables. You could always go to, like, the subway. There are options. You always have, like, you're never down and out, down and out, usually. At once, I was walking by a corner, and there was a bunch of people sleeping on the corner. I just joined them. I was like, I just grabbed some cardboard. They're like, what's up, Shaz? And, or maybe they don't even fucking, I think one of the dudes remembered me. It was like a year later, but just I recognize some people sleep in the corner. I'm like, well, that's probably a good spot if they're sleeping there. In a group, you probably chill. In the summer, it's fine. And, uh... But yeah, fucking, um... But so I show up, that version of me, that morning, and then, like, fucking a lot of these people are, like, in um, kids in college or other shit. And so I'm like, all right, fucking, we got people. Um, I'm already thinking, like, we're going to rent cars, maybe. All we got to do is scrounge up some money. And people are already offering a pitch. So I'm thinking, I'm like, all right, we could get like three to 500 probably enough to rent cards and do something else. And so I'm like, we'll just rent a car. We'll figure something out. But what are our resources? And then we'll break. And then we're going to come meet together again at like noon. So I give us two hours. I was like, let's just figure out our resources. Then we'll break and we'll come back with some options. And so then people were like, well, maybe I could get a car and maybe rent a car. And I was like, all right, let's come back in a couple hours. Let's do some research. So I came back with like numbers on a rental car. Like, all right, this is, if we could get this much money, but then uh, I think three people ended up having cars. I was like, all right, awesome. Fucking, we got uh, three people fucking, or someone rented a car. Maybe he says he'll grab the car. And I was like, awesome. We got fucking three cars now. Now we just got packing with people. So uh, who are the people with cars? Then I put them at the front. And I was like, all right, just line up in the car you want and just stand behind the, the car you want and ride in. And then people kind of like sort of shuffle because they didn't really know each other. But if they did know each other, kind of people got where they wanted to go. And you saw, like, the late fucking pickers are just, like, all lined up in the last one. It's like, whatever. Like, and I was like, all right, remember your car. Because we're done. We're, like, we... It was a very quick... I don't know why I'm proud of that. Like, quick solution to, like... Uh, uh, what other way would you solve that problem? But, um... Yeah, and then we were like, all right, let's do it. And then uh, let's... I think we had to wait for one more thing or something like that. So I was like, let's break. And at two, as long as everything's good, we'll go. And we met back up at two and all the cars are still, the people are still remember the groups. And um, yeah, we took off. And then we ended up at that farm with like 15, 17 people. It was just crazy in my mind that like, it was just an idea like, oh, they want to donate the farm to the movement. And all of a sudden we have like dozens of people at their fucking farm and we spend the weekend and we're like smoking the most cigarettes because they, she has a, uh, to save money, they have they roll your own, and they have this huge tray. So usually, someone's rolling and rolling cigarettes just to fill up the whole tray, just as something to do. So everyone's always usually smoking. We're already smoking down at the park, and um, yeah. And then uh, their kids are really cool. Uh, fucking, uh, they're like our age, and one of them smoking us out in his room in the basement and shit, and just stuff that happened. Let me think. We camped out over there the first time we went there. We had a big tent and a small tent. And me, I slept off in, like, a, a small tent off to myself. I was like, I don't want to, like, I don't know. It was weird. Fucking, it wasn't weird because those are just bundles of emotions. It was, um, I was wondering what was my motives. I, I'd started hooking up by, with a girl. Yeah, I started hooking up with a girl by then. A girl in the park um, kind of caught my eye or something. She was, she was thirsty. She was being a little flirty with everyone. But I was like, um. Uh, yeah, I knew what I was getting into. I was like, oh, she's cute. She probably thought the same about me. And we uh, we shared a joint. And then we kind of just, like, it was just assumed. I was just like, I would find her. And then, uh, yeah, she took me to a party or something. That's what it was. But we, um, we eventually started going back to her art studio in the Lower East Side where she lived in the studio and it had a huge basin tub for a sink so she would stand in it and she would shower in it that way and she was a um, she was a model a, a fine art model the f fine art model the ones that stand naked while people do their paintings and stuff 
Well, she was cool. Well, she was a little crazy. And I mean, there are ways that she was not cool as well. She, um, yeah, she's the one where, like, um, I, uh, we're having, I mean, she's really aggressive. This is where, like, some guys could be like, oh, you know, girl, woman, don't get, I don't know, I don't even want to wrap my mind around the logic, but she like wake you up with like a blowjob or like wake me up by like having sex with me, which is cool in my book. But um, but she, but yeah, we st first started hooking up and then she um she was kind of on her period and I was like whatever, dude, I'm not, I'm not about to be picky. Um, and uh, I'm cracking myself up. But we, uh, so afterwards she's talking about, we're talking about sexual history, like stuff you should talk about before, especially if you're not really like uh, protecting yourself too well. So we're talking afterwards about, oh, who you've been with or what's going on or what type of like, what's your energy wave right now? What's your, where, where are you at in the wave? Are you like kind of like mellow right in it? Or are you like just fucking like uh, fast and furious for a minute? I don't know ways to say stuff like that without sounding judgmental. But, um, uh, What is this? Four minutes left. Anyways, so she said she had some STD. She had like a, what is it? The fucking thing, the warty dick thing. And she gave me the warty dick thing. And then for like a year or two afterwards, I had to go to this like doctor and make sure just to take them off with like some uh, liquid hydrogen or whatever the fuck shit is that burns them off your penis. So that's the lesson is to use protection or else stuff like that can happen. And then she was like, I was like, that's something you should have told me before we kind of like, before we, we pot committed there. And then she was like, well, uh, but I thought I was on my period. It wouldn't matter. And I was like, you didn't think, you thought you'd be less infectious while you were bleeding. Uh, or something, I don't know. It just didn't sound. So in my mind, right, as soon as she told me I was really cool, I was like, deep breath. I didn't really get mad at her at all. I was just, but in my mind, I was like, this is done. Like, no, nah, this is what I get, and this is a life lesson and whatever. And, like, you learn to recognize some energies. And not that I won't fuck with someone like that again. I missed her, actually, a little bit last year. I was thinking about her. But just, like, for now, I, I need, we need to, uh, this can't go unnoticed. That's not, you're not being a good person when you do stuff like that. So my response was, like, I, I need some... So anyway, so I went up to the farm with that in my head. Like, oh, I'm newly single or whatever. Like, I just hopefully dodged a bullet. And then she went and she tried to blow me up on, uh, we had these online forums where we would talk. And she'd come into forums where I was, like, saying stuff about the farm or trying to talk about finance. And she'd talk shit about me. You know he's just a con artist. You know he's a this or that. <laughs> because, uh, yeah, when we were going up to the farm, I told her, I was like, yo, like, you know, we're not really, like, uh, I, I gave her that talk, like, you know, we're not really committed, committed, you know, like, I'm going, I'm about to go for, like, maybe a week, so I don't know what happens, but, like, just act like you're single, like, we're not really, because I'm going to act like I'm single, or something, I guess I didn't take responsibility for my emotions, and I didn't break up with her, and I didn't actually tell her, that was a little passive-aggressive in the bad way, I guess, I was just in my mind, was like, we're broken up, but I didn't really tell her, and just, like, acting like we were broken up, nothing happened on the farm, I kind of creeped on some girl, and, like, we were sleeping next to each other, and I put my arm around her, and that's one of the things that, like, I don't know, no, she cuddled into me. I think no one else was in the tent. It was just me and her. But anyways, nothing was happening. But, like, that's, like, a, I think that's, it's an interesting move. It's not one to be retired, but um, it, it, I guess subtlety is less, uh, that's more of a sure thing. Like, if you want to be, like, creep up behind someone and stick your dick in their ass and just kind of grab them around the waist. Like, people would like that under certain circumstances, but you got to... It takes a lot more qualifiers. Yeah. Understanding the, the subtleties of intimacy it takes a while, right? You can't... Not everyone is more in a black belt. Some of us have to earn it along the way. Yeah. Anyway, so now I want to <laughs> did my Kickstarter. So, uh, fucking OWS Origins. 
Let's read, no, let's read a article. Wait, no, we got 15 seconds. You know what, Shaz, you're doing good though, and I'm proud of you. Because even though I can't be there in the future to witness the man you become, I know that the man <laughs> you grew up from. Wait, what? 